Welcome to the Motoring Podcast, your weekly discussion of motoring news. This is episode 579 on Tuesday, the 21st of May, 2024. Hello, I'm Alan. Hello, I'm Andrew. And this week, we'll be seeing how making autonomous cars work is hard. In new new car news, the internet goes weak at the knees over one revealed car, except for somebody close to me. And in points of interest, the list of the week is very retro. But first, we do have three pieces of follow-up, and I will start with the news that the EU, or a politician for the EU, has accidentally on purpose let it slip that there will be tariffs implemented on Chinese EVs. No, sorry, Chinese company EVs, so I have to be very careful with this, because many EVs we get in Europe and the UK are Chinese-made, but they are not necessarily from a Chinese company. Let's not discuss Volvo, because that gets really complicated. Yes. The Chinese company-made EVs will get a tariff of between 25 to 30%. It is expected. Uh, I think this is all part of the PR run-up to any of these things happening, a bit similar to what you were discussing last week or the week before, talking about Mm. how China is going to throw brandy down the drains because that's, that's just dumping. So it's all the very public saber-rattling stuff that goes on. We'll have to wait until they are actually implemented. But that's expected to be, the first tariffs are expected to be somewhere around the start of July. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the US, it's gone from 25 to 100% on the tariffs there. But it's such a tiny percentage of the market over here. I I don't think I've seen one. So performative. But in Europe, it is not going to be performative. No. Well, it's an election year here, isn't it? Mm. All we can do is cross our fingers. Yes. Keep our heads down. We'll have the less damaging old man, please. Yes. I'm not that I'm allowed to vote. But. Yeah. You are a legal alien. Talking of America, do you want to take us to Cruise? Cruise is GM's uh, autonomous vehicle test research development brand, and it's not been going wonderfully well at Cruise. You'll remember there was a sort of all stop order last year. Yeah, it was at the end of last year, wasn't it? Yeah. When one of the cruise cars struck a pedestrian and dragged them along the road. Well, now, as a result of that, they have reached a settlement between the cruise's lawyers and the ladies' lawyers. And the settlement is somewhere between 8 and $12 million. Uh, she was severely injured by one of the robo-taxis last year. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that means that whatever she needs, she can now uh, afford to uh, restore her quality of life. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to stick with autonomous vehicles that really aren't. And this is the news that a judge has rejected Tesla's bid to dismiss a class action court case where it is alleged that the company has misled owners over the self-driving capabilities of the full self-driving program. And by the way, for those who just hear this on the audio, there is lots of inverted commas throughout all of those things. Yes, yes. Yes, (laughs) Yeah, it has to be reminded, and as it is stated in the Jalopnik article that's linked in the show notes, it is still only a level two driver assistance system. However, some customers are saying what was said in videos and marketing material and statements on social media implied that the capabilities were much more than they actually are. Well, eight years ago, yeah? Yes. And this goes back to what we talked about last week, of course, about whether something is stating an intention or deliberately misleading with how close things are in order to attract investment. Yeah. And again, to be clear, like we had to last week, by the judge saying this can go forward does not mean that the judge is saying Tesla are guilty. Yes. It's just that there are merits for this to be discussed in court. Yep. This is definitely one that's going to run and run. Yes. Big time. Big time. Which brings us to new news. The first thing really that's come up in the UK in the last week is that they're set to become a new offence, and it is death by dangerous cycling. Uh, This means that dangerous cyclists, who who kill obviously, could face up to 14 years in prison. This followed campaigning by Tory MP Ian Duncan-Smith, who said that cyclists should be accountable for reckless behaviour. It's a curious one, this, because, yes... There needs to be some form of law about this, but it's worth bearing in mind that dangerous driving uh, law is very, very rarely used, death by dangerous driving. Mm. And the uh, sentences handed down 
tend to be significantly, or at least the impression we get is that they're, they're significantly less than 14 years Yeah, uh, in most cases. It's a very curious one. Um, the trouble with this, of course, is it's creating a them and us job. Oh, it's as culture wars stuff to get. Culture wars is what I was trying to think of just there. And that's that's a bad and unfortunate outcome from this. Yeah, my only concern really about this is that it's another one of the, well, we fixed a problem by implementing a new law. Yes. And therefore everyone can be quiet. We'll see how it rolls out. I think it's one of these things that there's a lot of noise right now and then it will very rarely be used, hopefully. The percentage of incidents that involve such, or is claimed to involve such, are so small anyway. Agreed. Okay, I am going to take us to the US because I think this has implications for Europe as well. And this is the United States Federal Trade Commission has warned car makers that it is keeping an eye on them and how they collect data and whether there are any privacy violations around all the collecting of data and how cars are connected and speak back to servers that are investigated and information may or may not be passed on to preferred partners and the likes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yes. they underline this by citing three companies they have sued or they have fined not sued because it's different as they didn't take them to court they find them and they find them an awful lot of money for not treating people even in america not treating personal data well and that's bad because there is almost no such thing as personal data in america it depends which state you're in if you're in maine or Cal i think it's maine in california definitely california then there are some rules about these things. But you've got to remember that America is 50 separate small countries mm. that sometimes act together, but mostly try not to. Trying to implement something like GDPR is, is very difficult. I mean, I was saying to Andrew, I did our, our corporate IT and information security training yesterday, which was a hilarious way to end the day. And I just went through it thinking, gee, this just doesn't apply in America. Yeah. Just the, the sort of clarity of tick boxes and stuff. Anyway, sorry, I'm waffling and we're trying not to waffle this week. No, but it does remind me that it, certainly in the UK, trying to find terms and conditions for connected car systems from various manufacturers is incredibly difficult. Hopefully over here it is looked at as well. Yeah, and under GDPR, by the way, just using the car is not necessarily agreement to the terms and conditions of all of this kind of stuff because you're using the car to get from A to B, but then if the data's collect, being collected for loads of other stuff, then the consent does not carry because it might be different data uses. Do you want to take us to Mini? Because there are changes afoot. Yes, uh, changes afoot at the top of the Mini brand. Stephanie Wurst, who has been leading Mini for the last two years, uh, is only going to continue doing so until the 1st of August. She's going to be replaced by Stefan Richman, who is currently head of the BMW Group's Corporate Strategy Division, which may already makes me think that he's going to be a barrel of fun and laughs. Apologies for the stereotype. And this is relatively sudden. She says it's bittersweet that she's leaving, but she's going to be going on to another as yet undisclosed role somewhere within uh, BMW Group. It's obviously not a you've done a bad job type thing, because I don't think she has, to be perfectly honest. No. Two years, she's, she's rolled out three new models, which probably in the pipeline before the two years. But, you know, she's, she's kept Oxford as the place where the electric Cooper and Eastman and whatever else is going to be built. I think she's, she's, done, a, she's done a decent job in two years. They've, they've generally been in the top 10 when we talk about yeah. the monthly registrations. So, so well. Yeah. And there, there is no clarification from. BMW or um, Stephanie Verst as to why she is moving on. I no, no, but it does sound like the, the wording makes it sound like it. So, no, we'd like you to do this now, please, mm -hmm. as opposed to her wanting out or anything. Yeah. I am now going to start the section of autonomous vehicles is difficult, and we will begin with Waymo and the National Highway Transport Safety Administration, NHTSA, in the U.S., as finally, perhaps because of the tidal wave of videos on social media showing this, decided to investigate Waymo for their vehicles not complying with traffic laws. They have received 22 incidents 
from Waymo themselves, where they have uh, crashed or, and again, the inverted commas come out, exhibited driving behavior that potentially violated traffic safety laws. But also, they are stating that they will be looking at incidents that have been supplied via social media and by people in the public. What is interesting in this article that is in the register, that is linked as always in the show notes, is they do talk about how Zooks, Z-O-O-X, I think, or Zox, uh, they also are being investigated. And we have to remember that crews have only just announced that they will be resuming their testing in Phoenix only, but with a safety driver in place. Okay. I'm going to have in the show notes a number of other articles that add some context around all this and is, I think, a good time to just, particularly as the UK has just approved the Autonomous Vehicles Bill, um, but just show where the industry is at and this is in america where the rules are slightly slacker than they will be over here but still there is an article from the apperceptive by sam that discusses his perspective on how he was surprised that the technology was not further along than it should have been when he was dealing with various autonomous vehicles companies and and how far they got just to be clear Whilst I've linked to it, it's that's not to be seen as an endorsement for everything that he says in the article or perhaps his uh, optimistic view that autonomous vehicles will actually happen because anyone who's followed me or listened to me for any length of time will know that that is very far from the case. There'll also be an article from The Verge which gives a good roundup of where we're at with the various companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, And also, um, finally, there will be a meta-analysis paper that is titled The Problem with Podman that is wonderful. It's it's almost satire, but it isn't. It is in turn satire and academic paper. So it flips from being vaguely amusing to being pretty hard going (laughs) (laughs) uh, very, very quickly. Uh, But it's definitely worth reading the paragraph after the abstract. And and certainly the first two sections. Yep. Yeah, but they're, they're all definitely worth uh, checking out. And I think we'll bring you up to speed of where we're at and we'll help you see through the hype that is uh, still surrounding the industry after all these years. <laughs> just around the corner, just around the corner, like solid state batteries. We're yes. nearly there. Okay, let's uh, drag him kicking and screaming into the next story, uh, which is more of the same, really. Renault and its uh, consortium is going to shift its self-driving focus from cars to minibuses, according to the Autocar article that will be linked in the show notes. They say that Level 3, Level 3 Plus autonomy doesn't exist, everyone. That's, oh my God, level three is bad enough. Don't make a plus on it. I mean, apart I from it's not a real thing, but exactly. don't make it. A, oh. Is, inverted commas, unlikely for the time being, end inverted commas. Good. Uh, however, <laughs> there is a master-based robo-bus inland. So it's, it's like the trolley problem, but you put all the people on the inside. <laughs> You'll get letters for that. <laughs> I'm sure I will. The aim is that they will, that Renault will be able to uh, produce a shared public transport solution based on the new Renault Master Van. Uh, everything here is illustrated at the moment with the sort of push me, pull you Renault concept, uh, which is part of their We Ride consortium scheme, which was running in at least one town in France. It is a collaboration between uh, Renault, Easy Mile for the autonomous driving system, Stan Inf for the validation of software elements, Equans for the computer-aided dispatch, and Alstom, of course, for the safety infrastructure. Alstom, who run pretty much all the public transport infrastructure for Western Europe, and Keolis for the operation and maintenance of the new transport services. It is like a roll call of big international French companies that nobody has ever heard of, Mm. but underpin lots of stuff. If the little shuffle things look familiar, then uh, they look awfully like the Navetti R&D project, and I have a strong suspicion that that's what they are. I think that this is a repackaging of 
some older work mm. to show that something is happening whilst at the same time going, oh, actually, cars are hard, but maybe we can get away with the shuttle bus again. Well, there's a very interesting paragraph uh, which says, Renault acknowledged that the integration of advanced autonomy would make such vehicles more expensive to develop and build than their manually operated counterparts, but said these could be offset by not needing a paid driver. <laughs> Saying the quiet bit out loud. Give over. <laughs> oh, Which dear. is ridiculous, because you're going to end up, there's going to have to be a something. There's going to have to be a someone on there, whether it's a paid driver or a paid conductor. No, they believe that remote operation will fix it, and it doesn't, even though there's, there is increasing evidence to show it doesn't. These people have never been on the Paris metro, where in the corner of the carriage there is a tramp themselves. Oh, there probably is that as well, yes. And that's the kind of thing that would happen. That's one of the things that led to the downfall of the, oh, what was the, the electric shared car? Oh, yeah, those, those small cars that got them. Um, yeah, yeah. Blue something. The, sorry, there are so many of these things with made up names that it, they all become a fuzz yeah. in your mind after a while. Yeah, there's only so many consonants you can remove after a while as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so true. <laughs> Auto leap. There we are. That's what it was. Nothing to do with blue. Uh, yeah, so that's just one of the things that brought down the, the downfall of Autoleap was tramps making the cars smell, and then people didn't want to use them. So yeah. to, saying you're going to get rid of the people is, is not the answer in this case. You, you need someone. Well, it's not reality, I mean. No, but that's fine, is it? Will it last just long enough to keep people interested and make it clear that things are being done? Yes, feels like another timeline is required. No, I don't uh, but that. I don't have the time to make a timeline. Anyway, I'm going to take us on to the EU now, and we're going to talk about lorries and buses. And they have agreed uh, stricter CO2 standards for lorries and buses. Effectively, what it will mean is from 2035, all city buses will need to be zero emission. And by 2040, nearly all lorries will also need to be zero emission. There will be some concessions concerning e-fuels, is worth saying as well. Yeah, that's just baked in now, I think, after the car lot got that agreed. That's just a baked in. If you can hit these various points that make it an uh, a ecologically sound e-fuel, then you can use it. Yeah, yeah. And of course, there are exceptions. Armed forces, fire brigades, yeah. agriculture, public order and disaster control and medical care and stuff. Yeah. Don't worry about your electric ambulance running out of charge halfway or some other abstract whataboutery that you're going to come up with some of you. Yes. Well, not good news for the British electric truck industry, though. This time it is Teva, or Teva, which looks very much like an old Ford Euro cargo cab on the front of a normal seven and a half tonner. But yes, they ha have said that despite positive customer interest in Teva and its products, current global economic conditions have created a challenging environment for electric vehicle startups. As a consequence, we have filed notice of intent to enter administration with the court whilst the board is pursuing investment that secures the future of the company. Well, hopefully somebody can invest and secure the future of the company. Teva that had signed contracts with Royal Mail and Travis Perkins to supply vehicles, according to, to Fleet News, and uh, production of the 7.5 tonne electric trucks uh, began in Tilbury in Essex last year. Uh, the truck had a range or has a range of 140 miles, I was originally intended to be supplemented by a hydrogen fuel cell version. It seems to me that signing a contract with the Royal Mail is a guaranteed way for your electric vehicle company to die. Just appear in the Venn diagram. <laughs> they are certainly I know going correlation to is not necessarily causation. Yes, you keep telling me that. It does seem to be a bit of a coincidence. Yes, yes. Maybe it is just purely a coincidence. Yes, I think it's just that Royal Mail is interested in just about any sort of EV, really, especially given the last story mm. that they're going to have to make some changes, so they're going to have to line stuff up. And, and so they're, they're, they're kind of signed up and trying to order a few of everything, I think. Yeah. You know, well, if you look at their normal fleet, they, they do have a widespread of manufacturers, types of vehicles, and all the rest of it. I mean, we've currently around here, we're electric vans now. All right. um, which makes a lot of sense considering how close it is to a depot. It makes me chuckle that the US Postal Service, it is Mercedes Metris, which is a veto. Oh. But because it's the US Postal Service, they're not allowed to display the badges. So the, all the Mercedes badges have been taken off and replaced by US Postal Service Randalls. 
and they're on right hand drive. Would, would somebody oh, right hand drive as well? Oh, wonderful because you can't get them from Germany. Yeah, no, but you can't do that. You can't import them from there, so they have to be built in Mexico in right hand drive. So they're not the same as the UK one. Oh my god! I was going to say behind the round badges that where all the uh, ADAS system is uh, that gets nicked. <laughs> not, uh, not, not. I think they're so basic. It's, it's specified by the federal government, so the fact that they get a seat, I think, is pretty impressive. Oh, uh, okay. Well, yes, there is. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to round out um, the first part of the show with some interesting news for on EV chargers. Yes, bear with me. Uh, and this is from a company called Connect, and they have developed a turnkey solution which will be of particular interest to fuel forecourts. Now, as fuel forecourts customers dwindle in terms of internal combustion engine side of things as the years go on, they need to replace that because they've got this infrastructure in place where they've got shops and food outlets, which is where they make their money. And they still want to entice people to turn up to those rather than go to the supermarket or the local shops. So how are they going to do that? Well, to help them out, Connect are suggesting that they can provide a service and infrastructure that is almost like an all-in-one, including the software and the payment system, to just drop it in on the site and allow the forecourt to run them. Before you, anybody thinks that that sounds a little bit far-fetched and how on earth is this company going to do this, Connect is a new sort of subsidiary stroke sub-brand of Gilbarco Vida Root. Um, if you can't picture where you've seen that name before, have a look at a petrol pump the next time you use it. They already provide, Gilbarco Vida Root are leaders in providing forecourt solutions. But essentially petrol pump, the pet pump stuff. Uh, so it's, it's all that same background and it's all a sort of one-stop shop for the petrol station chains, brands, whatever, whoever decides to run the petrol stations. It's not an unknown. And I guess the idea will be that if there's a problem with, with the EV charger, it's just the same as phoning up and saying there's a problem with the pump. Yeah. That it's all going to be part of that same thing, single supplier for everything. They also help them get it installed and go yeah. through the red tape that's required for that as well. Absolutely. So, yeah. And I'm sure that the petrol, I'm sure they already do that for petrol stations, to be honest, because yeah. that's just as complex, if not more complex, um, really, given the sort of bulk sloshing of inflammable liquids type stuff. So this is really, I think this is one of the most interesting stories we've got this week. Mm. Just could be huge. In terms of, yeah, exactly. Just in terms of infrastructure and what what, what could and, and should happen uh, with this. And it's one that I'm, I'm interested in, in watching and keeping an eye on. Yeah, I think it's really clever of them to have seen this and chosen to follow it down the path because it would be very easy to dig the heels in and go no no we don't we just want to fight against this they've not they've not done that they've gone well this looks inevitable in certain sectors of the world in certain regions which it is um so therefore can we take advantage of this change is, is this an opportunity to take advantage of or is this a problem for us and they've decided to look at it with a glass half full yeah, I'm sure they've spoken to their customers first, mm -hmm. and and their customers have said, "Look, we actually won't do this, but we want to make it as easy as possible for us and for and for our station operators." Yeah. Well, that takes us to Guilt Minute, the quick break in the show where we ask for a tad of financial support to keep the lights on and the hosting running. If you feel the motoring podcast worth a small consideration every month, then you can become a patron. Different levels of patron include different levels of commitment from us to you, including being able to watch the show recorded live. We have a small range of merchandise in our spring store from stickers to mugs and t-shirts. And I keep thinking I should really try and make some new designs in there. But after 40 hours of sitting, staring at a computer screen each week, then it, the, the thought of sitting down for a few hours at the weekend is, it's not foremost. I, I will get to it, folks. We do need some, some new and interesting things yes. on, on there. However, if you don't have any spare cash, uh, we do completely understand. And you can help us by following for free from a podcast player to receive every show as they're released and by liking and rating the show in whatever way your podcast supplier lets you. If you've done all of that and some of you do so, thank you very much. Then the last thing you can do is to recommend us to your friends or colleagues. 
Thanks to everyone that does. Very much appreciate it. Alan, now we can have new, new car news. We can now have new, new car news. Alfa Romeo has launched two new Quadrifoglio-based special editions, uh, one for the Giulia and one for the Stelvio, and they are the Quadrifoglio Super Sport. Essentially, they are a Giulia and Stelvio Quadrifoglio where everything is black. So the paintwork is black, the wheels are black, the bits that might sometimes be chrome are black, the button, the buttons are black, labeled in black and a black background, all of these kinds of things. And it is, they are to commemorate uh, Alfa Romeo's first victory in the Mille Miglia in 1928. Uh, the prices start for 82815 for the Giulia and £91,835 for the Stelvia. You get black design details and badging, darkened four-leaf clover emblems on the front wings, black brake calipers, bare carbon fibre trim, carbon fibre mirror caps and front grille surround, the Julia gets an exposed carbon roof. There are new red 3D carbon info, carbon fiber inlays in the center console, all sorts of stuff like that. Some red embroidery on the inside. Most of all, you get Alpha's 2.9 liter twin turbo V6 uh, with, at 513 horsepower in both. And I would love them. Uh, oh, sorry, 450 Super Sports will be produced. 275 Julia's, 175 Stelvia's. And that's a premium of £4,500 over the standard cars, and I still would. Lovely things. Yeah, even in the dreadful black-on-black-on-black, black black, I still would. Remember early in the early days, in the um, the Sergio Marchione the stage, stages, when these were taking an age to come to fruition? Mm. And we were like, oh, I don't like those. don't like yeah. those. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. And then we saw one at Cov Motor Show. And then we saw one, and we went, oh, that's actually all right. Mm. And then we drove them. <laughs> yes. And and, uh, yeah, giddy kippers. <laughs> yeah, we are a bit, yeah. We both like these, whether quadrifoglio or not, they're just really nice. Yeah, they are very good. I am going to take us to Seat, the Lazarus brand from the VW group. Who, once they realized that they actually made a profit, oh, hang on, we, we like you again. I think it's a thinking man's Volkswagen, as far as I'm yes, concerned. Quite, but they have realized that they actually need to update their vehicles now that it is going to be made into a mobility brand. And this requires, <laughs> and yeah, don't say it, this right. requires an update to the powertrains as well as technology on the inside. So there will be new FEV, there'll be new petrol um, engines, uh, and there is the revised screen on the interior where you can actually see the temperature at night at the bottom Ooh, of it. I know, massive like, safety moves. Yeah, things <laughs> like that. Uh, but most importantly, I think, is currently starts at 23,905 and they're expected for it to increase slightly but still be quite uh, be about there. And that will make it an attractive vehicle to many. Yes. I'm glad they're still here. I'm glad they're still here. I, I think Seat Leon is, it's always been a, a good and interesting car. Mm -hmm. in a way that golf hadn't. I did generally, if someone offered me the choice as an ownership proposal, I'd probably take the same. Same price point, I'd have to say. Yeah. No shame in that whatsoever. Do you want to take us onto a car that I fear you may need to do a lot of explaining that you are not universally and 1,000% in love with, Alan? Yeah. Um, Morgan and Pininfarina have collaborated and unveiled an exclusive Barquetta bodied, I'm quoting from Autocar here, Barquetta bodied two seat sports car called the Midsummer. Note the tone, ladies and gentlemen. Note the tone. And first of all, I thought there's been a Malta. And it was like, <laughs> so what? It was my initial. It's like, it's a Morgan. What's the, what's the big deal here? They have done nothing. Morgan themselves have done more interesting reinterpretations of this, uh, of the classic Morgan shape. Than, than this. It's like pfft, they've stuck some wood on the top of the little door, flappy things. And and that was kind of it. And a sort of silly lack of windscreen and all these kind of things. But then I realized that sure the shape is pretty much the same, but it's when you start to look at the details that it's actually quite clever and there's a lot of work. I think before you go on, I think that is a key thing of modern Morgan. Like the last few years, how many times when we've covered one of their cars have we gone, but look at the detail, look at the details. Yeah. 
Yeah. So for me, what it was was on, on the Autocar article. Uh, there's there's a sort of slideshow at the top. Um, it's not the kind that keeps put text over the text. But there's one shot, one of the press shots, which is from the back, and it shows the 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 way the boot comes down mm-hmm. and the way it tapers in instead of just being squared off on most of the Morgans. And that was the point where I went, oh, hang on, that's different, and that's really nice. Mm. And so from there, it was like, oh, okay, so this is this is more subtle than I, I'm being harsh on this. And that was the bit that made me think that's really nice. And I like the wheels. I mean, I, I looked at it straight away. And, oh, it's got big wheels and then nice wheels. So what? It's a concept car. <laughs> well, it is. That's a, that's a concept car thing. Hmm. But it, no, the more I then looked at the details, like the way the louvering is on the side of the bonnet, I mean, the doors still look like whatever. The, you know, you just said that the the square on rear view was uh, was nice. I think well, the yeah. the square on front view looks great, and I think that helps show off how special it is. Well, all of the lights are in that in the headlamp roundels now, so you'll notice mm. there's no extraneous indicators, uh, side lights, whatever. Everything is all built in, and that's the kind of detaily thing. Which it was only after which I started to notice. And by the way, some people said, "Oh, they've been really lazy about the interior." I actually liked the interior first, with its pale wood, its slightly kind of Scandi style. I know that sounds silly, no, no, you're right, uh, but you're with right. the wood down the center console. So as I say, I, I went from going meh to then going, "Oh, actually," and then the more I look at it, the more I like it. Um, so I, I'm really, I really do like it. Uh, well done, Morgan, at the moment. You are doing a cracking job. And um, I know you worked in partnership with Pininfarina in this one, but your, the previous models we've discussed recently, like the three, the, the three-wheeler and then we oh, had yeah, the great. plus four we were talking about recently. The attention to detail that is going in now belies that it is a small car company it's one of those things where they've taken the classic shape kept the classic shape really kept the classic shape because that's what morgan's famous for but they just keep updating it a little bit a little bit and a little bit and just keeping it modern and they're making it more and more simple as you go Mm. on it is the absolute anathema of let's add scoops and slides and slicey bits yeah, yeah, and they've kind of you know, and, and even and that's when even they with do louvers that, on it, that's even with the louvers. I they know, are, but they no, but the louvers are are there, and they feel like that they are purposely put, yeah, as it, opposed to a lot of the slashes, swoops, and dents that we see. You just go, well, you were bored, weren't you? And you thought we must do something on this panel. Car designers, I think, sometimes are a bit like cartographers. They hate empty space, so they have to put something <laughs> in there. <laughs> and if it's like halfway down the wing, you get some some detail or scoop which is like here be dragons yes and if and if any car designers are listening if they'd like to email alan at we hate you at motoring podcast <laughs> move on to from the sublime to the ridiculous sandra <laughs> well quite yes now with a bump really back into reality and this is the news <laughs> that stellantis are going to launch uh, some leap motor vehicles in europe and the uk which will start with a super mini with a 165-mile range, moving up to a mid-sized SUV, and then a new car every year until 2028, according to this autocar story. Leap Motor, we need to remember, is the company that Stellantis have just invested an eye-watering amount of money into because they need to sort of uh, leap over the current competition in (laughs) Europe when it comes to... Well, sorry, that was totally unintended. I wish I was that good. Um, Or that bad. Uh, leap over the competition in Europe to get ahead with some better battery technology. And they feel this is one way to do that, which is to buy in heavily yeah. into a company already with it. The TO3 is going to be up against, but cheaper than the Dacia Spring. And it looks like more range, potentially. And potentially Actual a little bit more world. range, but there's the old choice of the unknown brand. Even with Stellantis' backing. Even with Stellantis back, where something looks like it has been, I don't know, it looks like a piglet crossed with a LEVC cab crossed with a Suzuki Alto, an older Suzuki Alto. It is challenging in terms of looks, yes, Alan. And we're on tiny little wheels. So it is a bit of a city rover up against any sort of developed for Europe hatchback. Mm -hmm. 
And my fear is that it's going to end up as a an aside because the quality is just going, it's going to be cheap. But you're going to know that it's cheap. Yeah. Although it does say it will be built alongside the Jeep Avenger, the Alfa Romeo Junior, the Fiat 600E, and the combustion engine powered Fiat 500. So I could be wrong and I could be being incredibly harsh here, but I don't think I am. The C10 is uh, an SUV that looks a lot like a Honda at the moment out the front and looks like it is, uh, what would you say, Kona size, something like that, maybe a bit bigger? Something like that. It says it's Model Y competitor. Yeah, but so I, it's gonna be a I bit don't bigger. like looking at them in public, so I can't remember what size they are. Yeah, I so mean, like it's Tucson, Honda Hyundai CHR, Tucson, Tucson yeah. size, yeah. 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 This will be interesting on whether this works. And then if it does work, how much sharing of platforms they do. Or or does it matter if it works or not? And just the fact they can get hold of the platforms might be the interesting thing. I think it might be getting hold of the platforms. It mm. all depends how much retuning the, the chassis people can do to make stuff actually work in Europe and not feel cheap when it's on the road. Yeah. Matching shocks, springs, road conditions, etc. Um, and mapping of, of like throttle responses and stuff like that. That's really going to be where it, it's, it's going to be. Cause if they make it drive all right, even if it feels a bit cheap, then that doesn't matter so much. Not at the price point. No, People exactly. People forgive at the price point because it's the price point. Yeah. Anyway, do you want to take us to Peugeot? Meanwhile, elsewhere in Stellantis, Peugeot has introduced eight year warranty for electric cars. It's extended its allure care to cover its electric passenger model lineup. It should cover you against reliability issues, et cetera, et cetera. It cut eight years, 160,000 kilometers or 100,000 miles uh, of warranty on the batteries. Should be absolutely loads. What we have to remember is that that um, eight year, 160,000 kilometers, 100,000 miles is actually a requirement in Europe and I presume in the UK as well. And what Peugeot are clearly doing here is realizing that the other components that are covered by the warranty, do please check your small print, they also will last if looked after in a way that they feel is suitable. Again, feels like a legal episode. A little, uh, <laughs> little bit of a, let's add the quick caveats at the very end of the article. In the UK, Peugeot plans to roll out across the passenger electric car lineup on the 4th of July. There, the Allure, there being the UK, the Allure Care program is activated automatically and free of charge after each service is performed for two years or 16,000 miles. Okay, so to so you need to have it a little done bit like the Toyota six one, six years yeah. at least. Designer's mood board, Andrew. Yes, designer's mood board, and this is the news that T. John Mayer has left Volvo and is going to join Bentley, where he is going to be the new head of design operations, where he will answer to Robin Page who is the design director at Bentley, who also used to work for Volvo, but moved across early last year. <laughs> Interestingly, because Mayer was in charge of the exterior development for the XC30, which seems to get universal praise in terms of looks. <laughs> that was one of his last things. And I think he also did the, or was involved, heavily involved in the Polestar 1, which was the, Vol sorry, he was the Volvo Concept Coupe, which went on to basically become the Polestar 1. Points of interest then this week, uh, and the lunchtime read is all about the soon to close uh, Stellantis Design Studio at La Ferte Vidam. I think I've got that right. I hope so. Well, I'm not going to argue with you, am I? No. <laughs> uh, and there's an article on it in uh, Lignotto, uh, which is in English, by the way, and it talks about some of the history of of that particular Stellantis Design Studio, some of the things it's brought us and so on and so forth and it's really interesting it's a really interesting piece uh lots of stuff about you know the background of ds the current style of ds range um lots of pictures from there do do have a read thanks to uh drew and joe of looking out that they had this uh, linked in their newsletter which is full of interesting articles that they want to share with with you but do go and look out for their there will be a link in the show notes actually to their newsletter that you can sign up to this is actually i've just been going through this and i've just realized that there's lots of lots of stuff around paris that, that Stellantis is sort of abandoning and one of them sadly is the c citroen c42 
building shop studio show area uh, on the Champs Elysees. I didn't realize that that has has now been shuttered. Sadly, it was really awesome, and it was somewhere I visited every time I went to Paris because it always had interesting concept cars from the past uh, and the present, and some of the, the current models there as well. But when you have a CEO who walks around with a hammer that says "cut costs," yeah, I mean, obviously, it, it's dirt cheap to maintain two different places on you know one for Peugeot, one for Citroen on the uh, mm. on the Champs Elysees. Uh, but it's a real shame because it was such a cool sort of sub museum for them. Mm. Yep, great article that one. Yes, excellent article. List of the week, Andrew. Okay, then, Alan, we have a slideshow from Autocar, and it is called Retro Rides at Goodwoods. This was from the Retro Rides Weekender, which was on a couple of weekends ago, but we are now including it this week. And there is a slideshow of forty-one pictures but it's roughly 20-odd or 20, 21 vehicles that have been highlighted. Is there, from this, any particular one, and these are cars from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, which have been either kept original or modified slightly to which you are going, oh, yeah. I mean, I know there's lots that you go, that's nice, but is there one? Most of them. Uh, the one I really like, the one I picked out, is actually is the Rover 400 Tourer. It's okay, a 416 yeah. Tourer. It's a good color. It's good a color. great color. Uh, sitting, sitting low, cross spoke alloys with a polished rim, which are like the worst alloys I could possibly own because I hate washing my car. But they look fantastic on it, and it just it just looks really good. I, I really liked it. Excellent choice. There were so many other things I could have chosen uh, as well. I mean, there was no no shortage of good choice in that list no there is a lot of choice that brings us to uh, this week's and finally and this week it's not actually an article uh, or a video it is a pdf we give you all the media we do we do (laughs) we do this week transport for london has updated their congestion charging embassy outstanding debt list now we covered this a little while ago but it makes me chuckle do you want to read the first yeah, well, the reason that this is, though. so, so let's, let's explain why embassies and diplomats don't like paying for the congestion charge. Uh, the reason is that the congestion charge is seen by most of the embassies as a tax. And of course, diplomats and embassies are exempt from paying the taxes in the country that they've been assigned to. Mm-hmm. However, Transport for London declare the congestion charge is a service. And to be fair, the UK government as well. Yes, and the UK government has declared that they are paying for a service and not a tax, and therefore they should be paying it. Mm. Obviously, there is some debate on this, uh, which essentially... I don't think it's much of a debate when you look at some of the bills. Yes, I know. So uh, essentially, TfL are pushing for this to be taken up at the International Court of Justice because some of the bills are getting quite high. It will fix a number of monetary issues that the (laughs) the organisation has, that's for sure. Over the past 20 years, the current amount of outstanding congestion charge for, to take the example at the top of the list of the American Embassy, is £14,645,025. At the other end of the list, the poor little folks at the Embassy of the Republic of Togo owe £40 in it, which is quite possibly just we haven't got around to paying that one yet, or oops, we forgot to register a car. Yes. In total, the outstanding debt is £143,527,113. But one of the things I like about this list, and this is silly, all right, is that you cannot predict who's going to be at the top and who's going to be at the bottom Mm. or any position in between. You cannot think it based on whether you like or not the government in charge or who has been in charge. Exactly, exactly. I mean, there are some of the less transparent governments where it's up near the top. So the High Commission for the Federal Republic of Nigeria owes 8395055 which is quite a lot of money. And they're sort of like fourth. But equally, some of the other embassies, which you might think may be a little bit 
of the sea are very low amounts, if any at all, of course. The Colombian embassy, for example, has only £1,530 outstanding. Now, it might be a bit fairer on the, the, the sort of the ranking if it was per you know, if there was some, some way of knowing how many diplomatic vehicles there's covered for each embassy. Because obviously or some... journeys. <laughs> well, obviously, yes, some are going to rack them up yeah. more quickly and more regularly than others. And that it would, might be interesting to see how per vehicle uh, what, the, what the ranking is. Yeah, because looking at Lithuania and their £655,000 they owe, that's quite a lot. Yes, I wouldn't for... have thought they were up there. No, no, not at all. But yeah, no. This this is a this is it's hilarious because of the opening paragraph, and then it's <laughs> it's hilarious when you, as you say, you read through the list, you look at who is where, how much they owe, and then try and go, oh, hang on, it's a very big number at the end. But it's the whole: is it a tax or is it a service? And I think it depends how much of a fight you're up for, really. Well, I think we can watch this, and if the international court decides that it is a tax, not a service. I expect the masses of London to then claim money back from, Don't from go TFL. There. No, I, I think that the mayor of London will claim all the money back from TFL. I will not incite a riot. No. I'm not doing that. Please, please don't. You, you don't have enough no. of an orange suntan to be doing that. No. I think that just about rounds us up for this week. It does. That means that it's my time to remind you that between now and next week you can give us any feedback share your thoughts for the show at motoring podcast on twitter and instagram on facebook and on the contact page of motoringpodcast.com the hub of all our activities uh, remember you can support us financially via patreon and please leave a review and rating on apple Podcasts or however your podcast app lets you do such a thing andrew in the meantime what's the best way to get in touch with you best way to get in touch with me is either on twitter or mastodon if you search for crap wing screen and if you want to connect on LinkedIn, I am there. So if you send me an invite, I will check out and approve those who I think are not loons. And Alan, if people would like to get in touch with you personally and congratulate you for digging yourself out of the hole with the Morgan, what's the best way they can do that personally? Best way to do that is uh, via either Twitter or Blue Sky. In both cases, I'm at AJP Bradley. That's B-R-A-D-L-E-Y. We'll be back very soon. Until then, I've been Alan Bradley. I've been Andrew Clues. And safe motoring.